The MMA Discussion Podcast is brought to you by SportsOfAnarchy.com. Visit our site for all your sporting news and needs. We're also brought to you by SubmissionFC.com. Enter the promo code SportsOfAnarchy10 for 10% off the best Brazilian jiu-jitsu gear. We're also brought to you now by the Flex Belt. Summer's approaching fast, and if you want to strengthen and tone your abs, the Flex Belt, which is FDA cleared, might just be for you. Follow the link in the description below to get your very own. The MMA Discussion Podcast is now available to listen on to iTunes and the radio podcast app Stitcher, which is available for free on all smartphone devices. How you doing, fight fans of the MMA Discussion Podcast? This is episode 24 of the MMA D Podcast. It's awesome to be back. I'm here only with admin Jonas. Jonas, say what's up. Hey, what's good, y'all? And it's just me and him today. It's going to be, I think it'll be fun, though. I always love having you on, Jonas. You bring a very awesome perspective most of the time to the podcast, so it's good to have you on. Yeah, man, I do what I can, you know what I'm saying? It's fun. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a while for me, so I'm glad to be back. Dope. <laughs> well, we're two days removed now, uh, as for as per podcast time by the time this is up, uh, since UFC 184. Awesome pay-per-view. I got to go. I was there at the Staples Center. It was so much fun. Um, had a blast. I hadn't been in a while. And, uh, yeah, man, that was a great card. Much better. For all the things that happened to it, missed, you know, three fights, three huge fights. Mir and Bigfoot, which was a great fight in its own last, uh, last week, um, over a week ago. Uh, then you have Yo Romero, Jacare, which was moved to the UFC on Fox 15 card. Uh, and then, of course, the main event that was supposed to be Chris Weidman and Vitor Belfort. Um, for all those fights that are taken off the card, the card still ended up being great. Um, had a, had a lot of great fights, ended up being four performance of the night bonuses for all the, for the many fighters that got finishes on the card. Uh, I, I had a blast. It was fun to watch. Uh, Jonas, what did you think of this card? I thought it was a whole, it, it, they really did make up for all of the adversity they had to go through losing those three matches. Yeah. Uh, it's still entertained. It's still, you know, it had some fights in there that are going to be notable and remembered for a long time so uh props to the ufc for actually making it up and uh getting it done anyway yeah it's all the fighters on the card that delivered um best that come to mind for me are tony ferguson alan jabwain and tim Means. those guys man killer performances um we'll move up the card and just see what we think first of all tim means with that upset over diego lima that was badass that was a great one those oh those elbows man that was a great fight, and um, personally, I think that that was a uh, that's a huge statement for him. He's won two fights now. I think you know, hopefully, he gets a, a good fight coming up. Uh, starting the card off, though, we had Tony Ferguson, uh, who beat Glayson Tebow. Now, Glayson did come in on about three weeks' notice, uh, I believe, for Yancey Medeiros, and Yancey is one of these guys that's coming up, uh, one of those uh, prospects that's you know been uh, looking great, all finishes in his wins, has a uh, um, you know, has a what it was I think he's a twelve and one record, twelve and two, something something really impressive. Yeah. Uh, but Glayson yeah. Tebow took the uh, the bout, the very veteranized Glayson Tebow take the, took the bout. I honestly thought he had a good chance, but man, Tony Ferguson has really you know he came out to impress and he sure did. Um, you know he 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 did well in the stand up, and then sure enough, it hits the ground and he finishes Glayson Tebow, which is you know. Very hard to do for as long as the guy's been in the UFC. I believe that's only the second or third time he's ever been finished. So yeah, uh, well that would be Glayson Tebow's second submission finish, a loss. Uh, he's been knocked out three times as well. So uh, that being said, you know, props to Glayson Tebow for showing up. Uh, it was a little over a month. Uh, he last fought on the McGregor Seaver card and then took this fight as uh, Nick said to replace Anthony Madero. So. Uh, very good stuff anyway, even though he didn't come out with the result he wanted. Uh, Tony Ferguson, you know, gosh, that guy, you never know what you want to, you're going to get out of him. I don't know how you feel about that, Nick, but, I mean, he does bring it. He always brings it every time he steps in the cage, and he's always been a game of fun, but you never know exactly what's going to happen when uh, Tony Ferguson comes in. So uh, yesterday I was very, I was very um, impressed and satisfied with what I saw out of him. Yeah, I mean the thing about um like the thing about Tony, yeah, I mean you're right. Even in wins, he doesn't always show his best potential. You know what I mean? Sure. Like when he yeah. fought Danny Castillo, that was one fight where, you know, I didn't feel like he had really fought to his full potential. Even with Abel Trujillo, I was um I thought, you know, he could have done better, but he of course he looked great in all these in all those fights. And hasn't lost a fight since Michael Johnson. I believe he's on a five fight win streak now. Um yep. 
And so, yeah, I, I believe it's time for a top uh, top 15 guy. If he's not already in the rankings by now, um, I, I don't see if there's anybody he could have pushed out. That's the way it should go. He's been on a roll, so let's give him some more bites. Let's yeah. Let's, um, let's look at the top 15. I kind of want to give him somebody. Who do you think he should fight next? Uh, well, let's look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, Ferguson should fight. With how much these rankings shift, I don't always remember who's, <laughs> who's, yeah, from, who's yeah. from like 15 to, you know, which uh, – it's very annoying. Let's see. Ah, here we go. Yeah, it was, it was a lot easier to keep up with 10, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, having the 15 there is just there for, you know, I guess well, pageantry, yeah. event, essentially. Yeah. yeah well, hmm. I don't know if Jim Miller's fighting anybody, but that's a cool fight. I don't know. Oh, yeah, he's fighting on the uh, April card in on uh, UFC Fox 15. I don't know who he's fighting, though. He's fighting somebody. Ally Quinta is fighting Jorge Mouse with all 13 and 14. Uh, I, maybe Nate Diaz. That'd be interesting. But <laughs> um, maybe Bobby Green if if the guy's ready to come back. I don't know. Actually, you know, I do like Miles Jury. Miles Jury's tied up with someone soon. Who is he fighting? Uh, or is he? I don't think he is. No. No, okay. I don't think he is. If he's not, if Miles is free, I, which I believe he is, and, or which I believe he is, um, I think that fight makes sense. Miles coming off a loss to Donald Cerrone, which was just a month yeah. ago, so I don't know, you know? Because, I mean, you know, yeah. some guys wait like a couple months before getting another fight in. Um, it's been almost that, but thus far, yeah, I don't believe that. Oh, like nearly two months ago. <laughs> yeah, that was at the beginning of January, so yeah. It was about two months ago. Let me look it up. I want to be definitive on this because if so, then my then my then I would love to see Jury. Jury is one of these guys that you know is very well all around, and Tony's starting yeah. to show that that same kind of uh, growth and skill, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, as far looking at his UFC profile and looking at his Wikipedia, he doesn't have any fights uh, scheduled. So I like that fight, him and Miles Jury, because um, both right. guys are great. Every, both in, in in you know everywhere. Of course, Miles has uh, has more impressive hands. Not more so than Tony, but just like more in his overall game. I think his striking is the most impressive. Um, yeah. He has decent wrestling. Uh, he's submitted guys on the ground before. He actually has a lot of submissions prior to entering the UFC. Um, with Tony, I'm sure that'd be a bigger issue. Tony did just submit one of the, you know, bet, one of the most veteranized guys who's only been submitted. Yes, as you said, twice. And the other guy was Joe Stevenson in his prime. So yeah. So hey, yeah, you gotta. I, yeah, I like that one. Yeah, like that's a tough fight for both guys because Tony, you know, doesn't deal with too many good technical strikers like uh, Miles is, and I'm sure uh, Miles hasn't dealt too much with uh, with really overall, you know. All around, skill, well skilled guys. Like I mean, uh, no, no offense to Jerry, but his last three fights prior to Cerrone were Gomi, Sanchez, and Richie. And while the Gomi fight was the most impressive, the Sanchez one was eh. And of course, it's Sanchez these days. And then uh, Mike Richie, who no longer is in the UFC. So yeah. So with that, I mean, he's of course a threat. He's ranked number nine. I think that fight makes sense, and I think Tony would really uh, surprise Jerry and could get the upset in that one. So I like that fight. Yeah, I like it. And then, of course, uh, L.A. homeboy Alan Jabwe, the Brahma, coming in. And, man, it seemed man, he had to come back in that fight. I mean, because Walsh was all over him. Um, uh, at the beginning of the bout, first half of the round, he was just coming forward, uh, plucking, at it, uh, plucking at him. And Alan just came in with that counter elbow and then, sure enough, wailed on him. Uh, for that finish. Now, I, for anybody that thinks that it was early, I don't believe it was. I, I oh, thought no, that was that was that was clean. Textbook, textbook flash KO. Uh, the ref stopped it just in time to save him. He needed it. He that yeah. fight needed to end. Yeah, he wasn't yeah. getting out of that. So. Yeah, if that fence wasn't there, who knows if he would have? Yeah, his exactly. head wouldn't have bounced off the mat. You know. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, that was a great performance by Allen. Good comeback. Um, yeah. And yeah, it was awesome because a lot of the LA crowd knew who he was, and that was awesome. It was a fun fight for him to see. Uh, that that was a welterweight bout. So um, with me uh, personally, I, I I would like to see him get back in there soon, whenever he can. Uh, who would I want to see him fight? I think I'd want to see him fight like a guy like uh, Hyun Gyu Lim. I don't know if you remember who that is. Yeah, yeah, I remember Hyun Gyu Lim. Yeah, I like to see that fight. That's another. That's a, that's a guy who's like always been on the cusp of top fifteen because he's taken on some legit guys like Tarek Zapadine and uh, you know knocked out uh, James Krause. 
Um, yeah. He's had some good performances, and so um, I think that that would make that would be a fight that makes sense. Allen's only what three fights in the UFC now. He's two and one, both knockout stuff. So yeah. he's looked impressive thus far, and so yeah, I can't wait to see him again. It's another guy up and coming who I'm excited to see. Definitely, man. Uh, Alan Joe, man, really turned it on. He showed a lot of heart in there, and uh, to come back what, the way he did, you have to have nothing but respect for the man. Yeah, one <laughs> Chris. I remember. I think it was Chris. Some Chris was like when uh, when Walsh was when was when the finish happened. Walsh just kind of hung on to. I think it was Big John that was refing that one. Yeah. And uh, and he's just holding on a bit. And and like you know how the saying goes, "Let me bang, bro." And uh, <laughs> Chris just throws the quote out. He's like, "Thanks for not letting me bang, bro." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, yeah, I think I read that one. That was pretty. Yeah, I mean that that was a fair stoppage for anybody because I've heard a few people telling me that it's that it wasn't and that it was too early and it, stuff. It wasn't early at all. You see the it replay wasn't. on that, you know that it's yeah. That's he definitely not the case. After he caught the elbow, he slumps over to the cage. Uh, Joe Van hits him again, and Walsh practically loses his feet, feet and stands right back up immediately. But he was just not there. Yeah. No. Not there. He was not able to continue. So, mm -hmm. uh, completely fair stoppage on uh, McCarthy's part. Yeah. I have no complaints about that. Yeah. And uh, we'll move on to the next welterweight fight. Jake Ellenberger submitting, I think for the first time in his career, uh, Josh Koscheck. Not Josh. I don't. I don't know if Josh has ever been submitted, but that's the first submission win of Jake Ellenberger's career, I believe. Um. And that was that that was impressive right there. But at the same time, he also did show a little a lot of hesitance still. That's the thing that he. Uh, that's the thing with um, with Jake that I, that always bugs me. He's ever since I think since the Martin Campman fight, he's been very tentative in there. He was with yeah. Rory. He was with Robbie. Uh, somewhat with Kelvin, he kind of did bring it a, a a a lot, but you know he was also very uh. I wouldn't say scrappy because that kind of insinuates a good thing, but he was very um. I don't know. I, I there was something about his energy. He was moving too much. He was doing too much. In that scramble with Kelvin, and then sure enough, that led to the submission that that got him finished. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, so yeah. so it's just he hasn't found that medium yet. You know, that where he needs to be, that very that fine line, that center, that helps him yeah. get to you know that, that helps him get these uh you know that these awesome performances. Uh, right. He just slipped that choke kind of out of nowhere because Koshchek was going for a takedown, pinning him against the cage, utilizing the wrestling, which seemed to be the only really effective thing against Josh because Jake was landing some good shots. For sure, he was landing a lot of good counter shots more than anything, but he yeah. wasn't coming forward, which is a, which is a thing he needs to work on. Definitely needs to work on coming forward, uh, utilizing movement uh, to to you know get on the inside and 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 you know work his range because he's got shorter kind of arms, but you know they're they're obviously the type that can knock you out. So yeah, the, the Ellen Burger that I missed was the one that fought uh, Diego Sanchez a few years ago. That was that fight was just great, mm -hmm. start to finish. And that was the Ellenberger we all knew and loved back then that was exciting to watch. Definitely. Not that he's been, you know, boring at all, but he, it's like, as you said, he's been a lot more timid, a lot more uh, hesitant to engage in recent, you know, in recent days and recent fights. Yeah, I believe so, if he was more aggressive, we could have probably seen a knockout. You know, we could have. God forbid I tease you with that right now, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all things considered, I can't be. Uh, unsatisfied or dissatisfied with how the fight ended uh that's gonna be an internet meme for uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah man as i was telling you before the podcast that was very odd how he was very foamy at the mouth like when you get choked like that yeah. it's not like you're producing saliva right now because your your body's more um attentive towards other things like getting blood to the head you know so uh, that that was very odd how you know i don't know he must have been very hydrated before that happened, obviously. <laughs> but um, that was very impressive for Jake to really find that um, that choke out of the, at, at the beginning, because it was like a it was like a, in, a inverted guillotine, um, and then uh, you sure enough, Josh tried to you know you know a gator roll out of it, and uh, it actually put him in a in a worse position. Uh, you know that ended up costing him the fight. You know that that was in some cases that is a smart defense, but. Um, Jake just held on, didn't let go that strong grip. Uh, so a very impressive submission. Um, because usually some guys just kind of lose grip, or the guy's able to slide through, but not you know Jake just 
mm, just squeeze that on there. That was impressive. I like that submission. Yeah. That was a good yeah. fight. Ellen Berger getting the the other one of the many performances of the Knights handed out. Um, yeah, that would have been uh, Kostek's second submission loss in his career. Who else submit, has submitted him? Who else has submitted Josh Kostek? Yeah, I kind of want to know. Uh, give me a second. I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah. One more Technical one. Yeah. submission to Drew Fickett in the second ever UFC fight night. Drew so that Fickett. Was back in 2005. This was Damn, that was a decade ago. <laughs> nearly 10 years ago. Yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah, that, I mean, what do you think's next for Kostya? That's four losses straight now. One, he's only won one in the last five, and that was against Matt Hughes, and Matt Hughes has been retired almost two and a half years now. Um, well, no, he's got a, he, he fought a guy named Mike, uh, Mike Pierce right after Matt Hughes and got a split decision win there as well. Oh, did he? That's yeah. right. But that was such a boring fight, man. It was. <laughs> I, Nobody just, remembers. Yeah, no one wants to. Yeah. So yeah. he's won two out of his last six then. So he's won one third of his last few fights. So Yeah, um, like four fights in a row lost. Hey, if, I always say if, if they kept Dan Hardy around for losing four, you can't fire anybody else for losing four in a row now unless they're just all disgusting losses. Now, which the these kind of are, but, you know, because he's – Waller, Waller laid him out. Woodley definitely laid him out. And then Ellenberger pretty much squeezes his head like a great. Mm -hmm. So – and then he got squeezed a decision by Hendricks, I remember. So that yeah, wasn't like too dominating of a win. But, uh, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I always wonder what's next for him now. I mean, uh, he, I, he says he wants to finish his contract out, and I don't particularly remember how many fights he has left on his contract. Um, I, I think he should if he, has, if he has fights left on it. He should finish it out. Yeah, make as much money as he can before he getting out of it, you know. He can, he's got the opportunity, so they finish it out, and then – Re, you know, reevaluate your situation at the end of the day. If it's not there for you anymore, uh, mm -hmm. thanks for fighting. Thanks for doing what you did. You know, uh, at one point he was uh, one of the most highly recognized uh, contenders in the welterweight division up until he fought GSP. So, yeah. You know, you know what was that, funny about that fight with Jake was he kept grabbing at his eye, and I didn't know if something was up with it. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I remember that. Yeah. I he, kept. Kind of, well, you know, sometimes Cos likes to oversell things. Yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, he's done that before. But I was thinking, okay. but just thinking of just thinking of GSP made me think about his eye, which made me remember that. <laughs> yeah, well, GSP busted his eye up. <laughs> GSP flat out bashed his face in jabs. So, uh, but it, what I'm thinking of, you know, he whiffed. Uh, he faked the, or he saw he flopped and sold a shot from Anthony Johnson um, when Johnson threw a knee while he was gro uh, on the ground. It didn't connect, and he sold it as if it did. So he basically did an NBA basketball flop. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, yeah, that was pretty funny, man. Uh, you know, but I think you know that if something was particularly wrong with it, you know, um, he would have said something, you know, but. Uh, and he had a round. He had between his rounds one and two to really kind of um, do something about it because he was doing it in the first, and then he continued doing it in the second. I don't know what was wrong with it, but again, you know, I I don't know what's next for him, but uh, you know, it should definitely be somebody not highly contended right now. I think he should just be like on a fight night card and fight somebody who doesn't have too big a name right now, who if they beat him could really start somewhere. Um, but that's that's kind of the position he's in if he gets another fight, you know. Um, Dan Hardy kind of got that same lift because Dwayne Ludwig, when he fought, Dwayne Ludwig wasn't really on his way anywhere. Nah, um, he was on his way out. And Hardy getting that win on him. Yeah, I think also that's another fight that he could get somebody that's on his way out. But I can't think of anybody in particular I'm trying to do right now. It's really hard to. Yeah. Because outside of the top 15, there aren't really any other welterweights making too much noise other than Neil Magny. Um, who, you know, which, imagine how that fight would have gone if it was Neil Magny. Oh, yeah. I think. Magny would have. Yeah, because the way Jake did look, I would have. And the way Neil looked when he fought uh, Kunimoto a couple weeks back. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. That probably wouldn't yeah. have worked. That probably would have, you know. would have worked out a lot sooner. Yeah. <laughs> that probably wouldn't have worked out as well for. Uh, Kasha, because it already didn't by the time it had gotten to the second round. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, 
I I hope that he finishes out his contract just to you know make your money before you bounce you know. But uh, yeah, that's the thing. He did a lot in this sport. He's done a lot in this sport thus far, and um, I particularly uh yeah, enjoyed certain fights of his as well. Um, he's always given me some moments where I got pissed because he's beaten some of my favorites in the past. But that's his yeah. style, man. He goes in there and he pisses people off, and I think he kind of embraced that, which you gotta respect. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would think if he fought somebody, maybe like somebody like John Hathaway, but even though I don't know what's wrong with him, he hasn't fought in a year. But that's just another name that comes to mind. Maybe Court McGee or maybe Joe Riggs. Yeah. Joe Riggs actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Joe Riggs needs something to do. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if he has a fight right now. Let me see. Don't take it. Take all the guns away from him, please. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Let me see. Let me see if he has a fight. If he doesn't, oh, he's fighting Patrick Cote at 186. Actually, wow, that's a pretty decent fight too. Pretty close. Yeah, 186. That's in Texas, no? No, 185 here. Oh, 185. Oh, Anthony Pettis card. That's coming up in March. Two weeks. Two weeks, right here. Which we'll talk yeah, about yeah, soon. Yeah, yeah, but just th those kind of guys, guys that are you know have been around for a while, like Joe Riggs, uh, maybe even Ben Saunders. Um, even though Ben Saunders seems to be coming into his own, so I don't know if that's a good idea. So, <laughs> really, yeah, Saunders looked really good in his last fight. So, yeah, so guys like that, or you know, Akiyama if he comes back, which whenever that will be. Because yeah. um, yeah. I mean, that's crazy though. Because he did have a he had a good fight in October, I believe it was last year on the Japan card. I really want to see him come back um, sometime soon. And I, you know, not just on a Japan card. I believe he's he's very he's sellable anywhere. Yeah. yeah, and uh, of course with Koscheck that could be like a co-main on a fight night, which would be great. So whatever Josh does next, I, I prefer to, to see. And so now we'll talk about the co-main event: Holly Holm and Raquel Pennington. The one kind of eh of the night, next to the Kid Yamamoto fight, because that kind of bummed me out. But this was for one that went the full 15, didn't really deliver too well as as it was hyped up to be. And I think that that was the issue. I think Holly took a took too much of the you know the what, what, how do you want to say it? The um, the pressure, the uh, you know, the expectations from fans to oh she can go in there and get the finish, get get at Ronda next. You know, uh, UFC jitters uh, don't always don't affect everyone, but they affect most. You know, they affect a lot of guys. To be co-headlining a pay-per-view in in your debut fight with only what I think she had eight fights before that fight. Um, Despite having been in the world of boxing, I mean, she admitted it already. This was the most highly publicized fight of her career, uh, yeah. despite because you know women's boxing, while as good as it is, it's not on the level of of women's MMA right now as far as popularity. Maybe even in the last few years, I'm sure if this was like the '90s, it'd be a lot different. But yeah, you know, you still had your Layla Ali's out there and your uh, Christie's out there, and yeah. Yeah, there was, yeah, women's boxing was more highly touted in the 90s where I think she would have done great, you know. Um, Absolutely. But uh, it's not those days, and so sure enough, she came in the MMA, make more money, make a, a bigger name out of yourself. And she has. She got the win. She got. I felt she won that fight. I felt she won the first two. I think Raquel took that last one. Um, but, yeah, you yeah, know, it's definitely – I think she needs to be – uh, I think she needs to certainly get her feet a little more wet. I think she needs to get yeah. more settled into to, to the division's competition. I believe she she is the top five of this division from what I've seen before she got in the UFC because she was just high, she was just thrashing everybody. It was you know it, yeah. t to the point I, where I, her I, skill I, level striking is no joke. You look at it and I and I and I am in awe sometimes. I didn't see that uh, this Saturday, but. Um, I've seen it before, and, and I know she's definitely capable of it. She was definitely not 100% herself in there. Um, so, I, you know, that, that's that's unfortunate, too, because for a lot of people seeing her for the first time with all these expectations, hearing all these things about her, you know, they're like, hmm, I don't see what the big deal was. When if you look at any of her fights, or at least even her last four coming in before coming into the UFC, you can just see what the big deal was about because her skill level is Definitely top notch. There's a reason that I, I've picked her as as a very formidable threat to Ronda, um, because she has a, she has the the tool set to really formulate a very formidable game plan against Ronda, and uh, and we'll get into that now as we talk about the the Ronda fight. Now, I well the only thing I can say about it is you know the very 
dumb move on Kat Zingano's part to start that fight. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I was, yeah. You don't throw a Hail Mary yeah, at the start of a game, you know? It's like, no. Nah. You know, it's like you don't see P. You don't see guys in the Super Bowl going for you know fifty yard passes in the in, you know to the end zone. It's a very very odd odd choice on her part to yeah. I, I don't know. It's like go ahead. It's just that I know that she'd said that going into any fight, people tend to say she's a slow starter, which is kind of true. She lost the first round to Misha, lost the first round to Amanda. That makes sense. But don't do that, you know. More than anything, just kind of settle and find your groove. But also, you know, try not to, you know, try not to get hurt. Stay away. Kind of follow your opponent. Try to see, you know, because she has this very somewhat unorthodox view of fighting where she's like, I don't worry about what my opponent's doing. I worry about what I'm doing, being offensive, being great, going in there. That that helps sometimes, but you also got to be very wary of what your opponent's going to do. And, you know, being able to kind of, snuff a sense of what they're bringing especially in the striking department or the grappling department she should have really felt that round out i would i thought that would have been smart yeah um yeah definitely needed a feel out process and that uh she's going up against the best fighter you know best mma female fighter in the world you don't just go in guns blazing thinking that she has nothing for that yeah you don't surprise somebody like ronda rousey you just don't and I think that's what she was trying to do. She was trying to overthink the whole thing. If anything, throw that like at the end of a round, you know? Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. do it when you need to. But, mm-hmm. you know, you've got five minutes. And then you got another five minutes if you make it. And then you've got another five minutes. So use that time and get the most out of it and then formulate your game from there. Don't just go in charging thinking that it's going to work. Now, mm-hmm. of course, hindsight's twenty twenty, folks. But there just, there's a methodology to this thing. And just expecting to surprise somebody out the gate, it's not a very successful uh, tactic. It isn't. Yeah. And that, uh, one one example where I could think where I can remember it didn't work was when Brock Lesnar just kind of steamrolled or just tried to bulldoze Kane at the beginning of their title fight at 121. Yeah. I was at that yeah. one too. And I just remember yeah. him, you know, just kind of planting his feet and blah, just trying to do it. And then sure enough, Kane caught it and didn't get taken down. Landed an uppercut that that had all that had immediately put Brock into uh, oh shit mode, you know. Mm-hmm. And so um, you know, it's, it's not always necessary for, to start a fight like that. Just feeling out processes are are necessary in fights like these, especially when you have so much time to to really gauge your opponent, gauge what you got, how you're feeling, what you can throw, your rhythm, your method, everything. Um, and so I mean, you know, I. I wish they could have just restarted the fight. <laughs> That's how I ended up feeling by the end of it. I was like, "Wait, come on, let's let's try that again." <laughs> um, I know. Yeah, a cat was very was very blunt at the press conference. She looked right at Dana, right in the eyes, and said, "Look, that was that was my bad. But uh, whatever I got to do to get a rematch, give it to me. We'll work on it. I I'm healed. I'm healthy." And uh, I want another shot because that's just embarrassing for me. And so I got, you know, props for her for understanding her mistake. And I'm sure if they rematched, it'd it'd be a different fight. So, I mean, hopefully, you know, um, she'll be able to quickly get a rematch somehow. You know, quickly, you know. To that point, Ronda also offered to grant her the rematch. Yeah. Now, you can take that as you will. Some people are going to spin that to where she's, you know, being a bitch about it and whatnot, but I think she's actually being respectful and realize that, hey, Kat didn't bring her best fight, and to fight for the title, you want to put on a fight that shows that Ronda's better and yeah. not just someone that wins off somebody making mistakes like that. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, it absolutely benefits Ronda to give her that title shot rematch as well, in my opinion, because that wasn't the best cast of Zingano that we've ever seen. Mm-hmm. And she know she's better than that we know what she can do yeah. so you know just to lose off of a silly 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 mistake it, it's kind of not good for you know the sake of title defense yeah it's not good for either party i mean no, there's good. no there's no disbenefit i guess you could say for ronda but i mean it just definitely would have would have uh, been better for her had the fight been a fight you know yeah so i mean yeah, i, I 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. I mean, I hope Cat gets back in there, starts beating off contenders. You know, maybe Sarah McMahon. If that that could make sense if uh, if she could beat Sarah. You know, because Sarah's another person trying to come up. Both have losses right now. Um, that fight kind of makes sense. Her or Jessica I. But I actually think you know, since Ronda's Ronda stated after this fight she's gonna be doing a movie. Rumors are it could be a, a Marvel movie. Yeah. But um. She wants to finish filming for a movie. After filming, then she'll come back. So if if uh, that's too long for Betch Cohera to wait, I would actually like to see Betch Cohera uh, fight Jessica I or Holly Holm. But uh, you know, I'm sure that they're they're just they're gonna try and build those those two, if not with Cats and Gano, those three as best they can, so they might not match them up against each other. Jessica I is one of these these girls who could who could potentially get up there. So, uh, <clears throat> as far as I know, she's won like two fights straight. I know she had that ear popping performance uh, <laughs> in her last fight against uh, who was that Leslie Smith. Um, there's some names out there, and with I don't know what's next for Holly. I, I certainly don't want to see her fight Ronda next. I think she needs to get more acquainted and accustomed to the octagon and the competition that is there. And uh, if she can start, if she can start putting some momentum together and start, you know, really showing what she's got. That we've seen from her before, you know. Then, um, yeah, if she can do that, then by all means, give her the shot. After she does that, though. Yeah, not next, you know. And uh, if anybody is next, I would think it's Beth Cohea. Not that, not 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 that there's anything against um, giving home the fight next. If they didn't, I just you know I don't think it would sell as well as if you could if you build home up a little more, you know. Yeah. Um. Uh, that, I heard a really silly argument where someone told me home needs to be next because you know the Betch fight doesn't sell, doesn't do this. Oh, I remember that one. That's silly. I that one. Yeah, that's and kind now, of silly. Yeah, well, I wonder how that person feels now that he watched home. The play. home fight, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I gotta look this guy out. I gotta find him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where I wonder where he is now, thinking that same thing after you know. Struggling the way she did. I don't want to say it was a struggle, but it, it just wasn't a very impressive win. Over a, once she didn't game, bring her A game. So That's the thing. She didn't bring her A yeah. game. And for people that didn't see her or haven't seen her before or for the first time, would think that's all she's got. That isn't all she's got. Same with Kat. Right. That isn't all she's got. You know? Right. Very much so. That's what I think. Yeah, so. Best O'Hara hasn't looked boring. Mm mm. She hasn't looked. You know, she's been, she's been very dominant in her last few fights. Yeah, she she got a finish against uh, Shayna Baszler in the last. Uh, she absolutely had a great fight, a great. She's she's a really good striker, great boxing as well. Um, yeah. Looked really good against Jessamine Duke, and then of course retired the the always uh, lovable Julie Kedzie, which sucked because I was, yeah. you know, I was I, when she was fighting Julie Kedzie was one of my favorites. Um, yeah. And you know, beating Julie is not no joke. Beating Jessamine. Eh, but beating Shayna Baszler the way she beat her, mm, that was yeah. that was impressive. Yeah. And with three wins, I understand. But that's the thing: if she gets one more fight, I think Jessica I makes a lot of sense. You beat her, that's a good win. You know, I mean, if she can get someone top five, like say Betch gets Misha next and then beats Misha, there's no doubt. There's no conversation. Yeah. Um, and I know that Betch has been calling out Misha if she doesn't get the Ronda fight. Um, I just know that Misha is out right now with a broken orbital bone from that last fight. So. Um, I don't know how long she's out for, but if she's not out for too long and she can com come back at any point soon, like like say summer or something, then I, I would like to see that fight, and then we'll see who comes uh, comes next. You know, especially if Betch gets the win, and if Betch doesn't get the win, then you know, home definitely needs to get to work a little quicker. <laughs> but um, that's the thing. It's it's very it's very uh it's almost it's very wide open, but at the same time, you know, very uh very small you have this small group of women that are all kind of just you know topping each other like spinning tops hitting each other trying to get to that spot with ronda and at the same time we're all thinking like hmm how would that really go if they fought ronda <laughs> that's the thing and um yeah that's a that's a bummer thing and and not that you've said this but it's a conversation we've kind of gotten on on, on par with where people think that just because the you know ronda is so dominant it doesn't mean that she's that good and I don't really, I don't agree with that at all. But um, that's really a yeah. Well, you know, 
Now go ahead. I only brought it up because it, it is a question, you know. Mm. I personally, Ronda is great. Ronda is a great fighter. There, there is no mistake about that. It's silly to say that she's not. She's a flat out winner, and she she just fights better than everybody else in the division, and that's all that's all that really needs to be said about her. She's better than everybody else. Yeah, I mean, n nobody has really so come mean, around and looked as great as she has in any portion of anything. I mean, people want to say, well, look at Cyborg, this, that, and the other. But, I mean, she's fighting girls at 145 that, you know, I think I think if Cyborg fought Julia Budd and looked like that, I'd be much more inclined to say, yeah. But um, she fought Charmaine Tweet, who, you know, lost to Rousey in about the same amount of time. Um, she fought... Uh, was it? I guess I think her most impressive win is Marlos Kunin. But then after, but before that, she she beat a, a Japanese fighter that had only won two times in the U.S. and all the rest of her wins were in Japan and stuff. And then um, and that's and that, that doesn't even count as a win because that's the fight she popped positive for PEDs for. You know. Yeah. So she's had a tough time. Go ahead. And then she beat Gina Carano. Who everybody's been was. Oh you know, yeah, that was a while ago. Yeah, that was in '09. That was six years no. ago. Yeah, no, no, that was '08 even. It was maybe whatever yeah. it was. It was a long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. So. And Ronda's you know. been much busier. Been much more. I, I say her yeah. competition's been been much more tougher. Not to say that the competition at 145 isn't. It's just that the that that the ladies down there that she's fighting as opposed to Cyborg are much uh, much more inexperienced like Charmaine Tweet what while she is an older fighter not older than Cyborg but just one of these like she's in her mid 30s like Cyborg is um, yeah like they're at thir oh, 32 okay I'm looking it up yeah 32 not even 10 fights you know as opposed to Cyborg who has almost 20 um you know I I don't doubt that Cyborg it would be an amazing fight if they can make that fight happen fucking make it happen you know any day we can see that fight, I want to see that fight. Plus, I think the sooner they make that fight, the more it benefits Cyborg. And I said that a year ago, so it's it it's less beneficial for her these days. The more time goes by. Yeah. I just, I, you know, yeah. it just, it, and I don't like that people are like, you know, they bring her up and they're like, yeah, well, until she beats, beats her and this, that, and the other. I was like, well, you know, why why does she need to, to catch, you know, con, con, compensate the weight, the weight issues, the uh, you know, uh, the the catch weight, 145. Ronda doesn't need to do that. I know Cyborg's a champion, and I respect that. I don't even think people really bother to remember that she's the featherweight champion at Invicta for <laughs> for uh, Cyborg. They just know that she's so dominant these days. Um, yeah. But I, I understand where Cyborg's at. She's the most dominant 145 pounder in the plant on the planet. Probably at 155 if she wanted to fight there. Um, and all the 155ers fight in Japan because there's not too many of them out here. Um, no. And then, uh, but yeah, see, that's the thing is that, you know, Cyborg is great. She's a tremendously skilled fighter, I believe. Um, but at the same time, I, you, you just see Ronda's skill advancing to the point where if you asked me two years ago, I probably would have said, if that fight happens, probably Cyborg. But now I'm thinking, hmm. Probably Ronda, <laughs> you know. I just believe she's gotten so much better. That's the thing about her. She was two years ago the scariest chick on the planet next to Cyborg, and she still is. Cy Cyborg's still a scary chick, but she's gotten better. She still works her ass yeah. off. She still gets in the gym. She still puts her name out there. She still works hard. She still does all this training. She's still up to learning, learning new things. She's still adapting her striking skill and now using it in fights to where she's successful. She's gotten she like you know, way better. You know, yeah, exactly. Definitely open it up. She's not a one-trick pony. No, and people so, used to say that about her. That's not the case that anymore. Was, yeah, that was the criticism with her first, you know, eight fights being by win by armbar. Mm -hmm. But hey, she said, "Fuck y'all, I can win. I can knock people out. I can, you know, knock people out with not even tag them in the face." Mm hmm. That's the crazy thing, man. Her first knockout was a kick. To, was a knee to the ribs. Yeah. That's crazy. It is. That's insane. And then sure enough, bam, right hand, and then she throws a, a base, a, a nearly unconscious person around. Because <laughs> there's, it's oh, arguable that that right hand that Ronda landed on Alexis probably put her out. Yeah. 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 
That, 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 I so want to see that fight. I mean, people, I mean, the best comparison for it is it's like the Pacquiao Mayweather of women's MMA. It really yeah. is. Because those are your two best. The yeah. two best women's fighters on the planet. Yeah. Um, more, more time that passes and that fight doesn't happen, the more it becomes irrelevant. Yeah. Nobody's, think about if this fight between Pacquiao and uh, Mayweather were to be booked even three years ago. <laughs> Even three years ago, that is all. We will be talking about that right now. Still, <laughs> yeah. Talking about that right now. It's in, yeah. Right I mean, now. it's it's just so man. It, it it's it's a hard thing because I want it to happen. Who knows if it'll happen? It's yeah. it's up to Cyborg, in my opinion. And I don't want to sound like Dana when I say that because you know I know that that's the thing with Ronda, that's the thing with Dana. But that is the thing. She she. I mean, it's why would why would a champion of the UFC need to move up to fight somebody from a lesser organization? Which Invicta is. You know, it is. You know, it's not like she'd be fighting Cyborg for her belt, or if I catch weight, it, there'd be like well, anything like on the line. Who has the UFC record? You know. I mean, I understand some fighters, you know, hey, let's look at Anderson Silva. He did some non-titles. He did a few non-titles going up. And he could go there. Yeah. You know? Uh, we've seen fighters, you know, change. But see, but that's different because this is a fight that really, really matters. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like this is some random chick at 145. Like, if she was fighting, like, say, Ediana Gomez or somebody, you know, from no, 145. I'm actually arguing to say that she doesn't need to do that. Yeah. Because Cyborg doesn't belong to the UFC. Cyborg didn't have to make, or so uh, Rousey doesn't have to make any concessions. She owes no concessions to Cyborg. Yeah. If she's gonna UFC. This is her. This is Ronda's house. That's you know the thing, mean? man. Yeah, and, I, and and you know, if Cyborg can't make the weight, she physically can't, then it just makes sense that it's a fight that we'll never see. I don't yeah. understand that. That's different. I don't feel like this chick's even trying, though. <laughs> to a degree, I feel like she's she says she's trying, but I don't think she's really trying. The second she got injured, she was like, "Yeah, I don't want to." Yeah, you know, I'm gonna go yeah. back to 145, do what's comfortable. Let's, let's not there's there's absolutely no arguing that if Cyborg continued where she's at, stayed at 145, um, that she wouldn't be considered the most dominant 145 pound women's uh, fighter on the planet, but only at that division, because you know the the more credible opponents are on the lower weight classes in in, uh, in women's MMA, like yeah. straw weight. Um, those 16 women that were on, like, or at least the top 10 that were on the, 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 the straw weight tournament of the ultimate fighter, they ha are legit badasses. And as women fighters, they look so much more technically oriented. They look so much more, you know, well-trained. Um, they look so much better in general. And there's a reason for that. Those are, those are women who are at the size of, of like, you know, a real potential kind of Amazonish chick. Where they're strong, right. they're very powerful, they're very athletic, they're skilled. Um, they're quicker. They're quicker. You know, 125 is kind of like that. 135 is certainly like that in most cases. In certain cases, I can see where a lot of people argue it's not, but um, doesn't mean that they're not skilled. You know, and that's the and thing the that I've got. The men's side of it, you know, you're going to have your best competition. I mean,. Granted, because you know the average man is about 170, 180 pounds, mm -hmm. but you're gonna have the best best competition around 170 and 155. That's where most men fall. So you're gonna have the, you know the large, large numbers give you where you're gonna have better fight there. So you know most women that are in shape, they're gonna be around those weights, 125, 115. Mm -hmm. But see, that's the thing with Ronda is that like I think 135, you have some of the most aggressively well built women in, on the planet as well. 145, I, I would say, you know, is kind of hitting like a light heavyweight factor where some guys really have to compensate their skill to their size, you know. Um, with 170 pounders, 155 pounders, you know, you know, they generally don't have to do that a lot of the time, you know, unless they're a certain kind of stature. That's the thing about fighting. Um, with 145, it's different. Weight is an issue um, unless you're heavyweight, but uh, especially as a woman fighter, weight is an issue. Um, Especially for them, cutting weight is much harder for women than it is for guys. So, 
You know, I, that's why I understand and, and kind of believe that if Cyborg can't make 135, then she can't make 135. And I don't think anybody should be throwing that in Ronda's face or Cyborg's face. It's no, just a fact. Right. It's just what's going to happen. Um, it's not works out. It's my thing is this. There, my thing is this. For, uh, my last notes about this whole subject is this, is that many people want to say that Ronda will not become a legend or that she won't be considered it or that she can't be considered one of the best fighters in the world because of the fact that her competition is not up to her level. That's not really fair. A lot of people weren't up to Michael Jordan's level and people consider him a legend. People couldn't put people could he could dribble all up and down a lot of one of some of the best guys in the 90s and they couldn't handle him. You know, they just couldn't handle him. That doesn't mean that he wasn't great. Same with Ali. There were guys that couldn't util- they couldn't get used to that footwork. Doesn't mean that he w- isn't known as the greatest of all time. There are people that can't handle Ronda's Geo. That ma- doesn't mean that she's not the greatest of all time, especially when you think back five years ago, the women she's fighting would be tearing each other up. The division would be crazily, you know, at going at each other's throats. A lot of them would be, you know, beating each other out, and it and it'd be different. It'd be exciting for sure, but you wouldn't have somebody making a, a Hall of Fame name for themselves. Like I believe Ronda is. And that's where I believe Ronda's at. Because I've seen these women train. I've trained with them. And they train their ass off more so than guys in some cases. I believe. Especially Ronda. I believe she trains harder than a lot of guys. Definitely. Just watching her train. It's insane. The shape she's in. The way the way she trains. All the things she does to train. You know, she travels across certain... Um, Plains of California. She trains with Diaz to get conditioning, which is probably the best thing you could do for your conditioning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and there are a lot of women that do that. They accommodate, and it's a thing. Of, and it's a thing that they do need to play catch up. I'm not here saying they're better than men or that they're even on their level. I'm saying that they are definitely working their ass off to get there. And when they do get in there, they certainly bring it. They bring the fight. They bring aggression. They bring a lot of, of, of commodity of skill. They, they bring a lot of technique. They bring a lot uh, uh, to offer. And, and, and I don't think that any of them are bad. I don't think that any of them, you know, it's, uh, at least in the UFC, some in Invicta even, um, are, uh, are, 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 are at any kind of C level or even B level. I believe that they're, yeah. they're still trying to find a, uh, like a common ground. And women's MMA is kind of like where MMA was in the early 2000s right now, where guys had, had great skill in one, sp- in one particular field, and then they were trying to custom the rest of their style to uh, everything else. You know what I mean? Because like, look yeah. at Holly Holm. She's a she's a badass striker with decent grappling. But she started off with just striking, and then you even have Ronda. Ronda's a perfect example of that. She was strictly a grappler, and then sure enough, she, now she's got hands. Now you have um, you have Cyborg Santos who who is strictly just knocking chicks out, and then midway throughout her career, she started submitting chicks as well. Now she's back to knocking people out, but she earned her black belt throughout her MMA career. You know, there there's these chicks that are trying. To, to, to really uh, accommodate their skill to where it, it is on, on the level of men. And it'll take a few more years to get there. But right, even now, uh, the, the, the competition that she's facing, Kat Zingano, Misha Tate, especially Misha Tate with how Misha has looked, um, Sarah McMahon, those are names where, man, if Ronda didn't exist, would definitely be all just clawing each other for that belt, if not somebody already reigning over the, the top of those three. You know what I mean? Um, right, and 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 everybody would be saying that okay, wow, this division's crazy. It's competitive. All these women are great, but because Ronda's so good, people don't really. She's so good that starting off a division like that does kind of hurt it in this sense because people don't see how good everybody else is. They just see how good right. she is, and they want to measure the bar level of everybody's talent in the division to her level, and that's impossible right now. <laughs> yep. Because you cannot do that. Yep. Yeah, she, she flat out far and away eclipses everybody. Yeah, and to start a division out like that is is the one negative thing that came from Ronda starting a women's division. That's the one negative thing. Everybody wants to 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 put her, that she's the she's the she's the bar that that's been raised where everybody needs to get to and they can't because they can't they don't consider it a good division and that's just unfortunate. And if you're listening, please just take that to heart and understand that that is not the case. These women are badasses. They are definitely good. And um, and, and I believe that there's a reason that they're in the UFC. And, I, and they belong to be there. You know, they, they belong there. They, they certainly uh, have earned the right to make what money they can in the UFC. Because I've heard some people say some really stupid shit saying they don't deserve the money or the credibility or the sponsors. All that stupidness. 
Silliness. Women are badasses, and I love watching them in MMA. I've been a huge fan since 2008 of women's MMA, and I know that may make it sound like I'm biased, but it's because of that that I've seen how hard these women work. I can see how far they've come, definitely, because the, 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 the skill level from then and now is night and day. So that's just that's just my final closing thoughts on that. As far as Ron of who, fa who she faces next, I think Betch Cohea makes a lot of sense. If it doesn't happen soon, then Betch should fight somebody like Jessica I or something. Any closing thoughts on this or anything you want to bring up particularly? Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, Jessica I or uh, Besh Cahaya would be great. I'd say set them up for an eliminator and make that happen. and We'll see what happens. Or just give uh, Kat Zangano another shot out if she wins another one or two. Yeah, I would definitely be down for a rematch, like, immediately if they, like, as long as they made it, like, a co-main, you know? Yeah. You know, if the main event falters again, that would be unfortunate, but I don't think that would happen. But then again, you never know. We've had so much bad luck. In the last year, I looked up this fun fact. In the last year, it's not a fun fact, actually. It's a not fun fact. Um, that there has been, <laughs> that out of, since the beginning of 2014, we've had 10 main events fall out. Yep. That's pretty bad. And one, and yeah, one of, the, one of which actually caused an entire card to go away. Yeah, 176 was canceled because of it. That's just, man... That's some shit. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. We also wanted to talk about, uh, now moving on to this one, the, the Bellator card that happened uh, on Friday, 27th, uh, the British Invasion, for anybody that watched it. That was a great card, the main card especially. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I uh, watched the prelims, but there weren't there weren't too many noticeable names or performances of sort. Brennan Ward starting off the Bellator card. Um, yeah. Man. Was, great performance. Nice. Great hands, and then sure enough, the second he goes to the ground, he just jumped all over that kid. Curtis, uh, what's his last name? Uh, shoot. It started with an M. I don't want M yeah. And I want to remember it because I commend the dude for taking no, that fight. No other stuff like that. Let's look it up. Ah, here it is. Because I want to remember his name. Here it is. Where are you, damn it? Curtis Melinder. Yeah, Millinder, yeah. yeah. Oh, Millinder, whatever. <laughs> um, that was a great performance by Brennan. He was supposed to face that very, very charismatic Michael Page. I'm very unfortunate they get a pull, pulled yeah. out from the card. I'm, I'm even more interested in seeing that fight now because Michael Page has fought, the, fought these guys that, you know, he's so, I guess, showmanistic while he's in there fighting guys that, you know, guys kind of just stutter or, you know, Stiffen up when seeing him. I don't think a guy like Brennan Ward would really make that kind of mistake in there with him. I think he'd be very yeah. aggressive. I think he'd be very confident enough in himself to just move forward and attack the guy. Um, obviously, Michael Page has a has a very um, somewhat dangerous level of skill to to have made it as far as he's made it this far, undefeated with as many finishes as he has. Uh, he hasn't faced any huge names uh, or prominent ones as of late. So you know, Brennan Ward makes a lot of sense. So I hope they make that fight next. Um, Linton Vassell, who recently yeah. fought for the light heavyweight uh, belt against uh, Emmanuel Newton, who is who we'll talk about in a little bit, um, coming off that loss uh, and beat Sokaju. Poor Sokaju. Yeah, you know we kind of saw it going that way. Uh, Linton Vassell just had everything, and Sokaju had nothing for him. Yeah, that I mean that's always grappling's always been a very you know a very uh, a weird, yeah, big weak point for uh, Sokaju. So I'm hoping he's able to fix that, but it's kind of late in his career, so I don't know. I'm just wishful thinking at this point. What is he, 16 and 14 now? It's pretty bad. Um, yeah. Move on. Paul Daly and Andre Andre Santos. Holy shit, that was a great fight. That was a great fight. Now I'll say this: Paul Daly came in there and landed some bombs on Andre. And put him down a few times, and he absolutely blitzed him at times when he went to the ground, and he still couldn't get the finish. And that's more so Andre's uh, uh, wherewithal to be able to yeah. find you know good defensive posture and positioning on his back against a guy like Paul Daly, who's bringing the pain, um, you know, quickly and violently a a as it were in that matchup. That was just that was a big show of heart on Santos's yeah. part, man. Absolutely. That made me a fan. Straight up, all heart from Andre Santos, uh, hanging in there the way he did. So I, I gave him props for hanging on. 
Uh, I give Daily props for, you know, I mean, he tried to put it away as many times as he could. He really did. He kept going for it. Uh, even late, in the, he nearly had a finish at the beginning of the third round. So, uh, Bailey, congrats. Good look. Uh, good to see you back in there. If you're listening, if, if anyone wants you to listen, you know what I'm saying? That's the thing with Paul, man, is that uh, I hope he fights more so in the U.S. He, he's so he's definitely got uh, – he could definitely build a very nice fan base out there. He's got a nice oh, yeah. one in Britain for sure. He's one of the most popular fighters out there um, yeah. in Europe uh, in general. Um, and even in, in Brazil, because a lot of the opponents he's fought recently in um, in Europe are, are a lot of Brazilians, uh, even, yeah. even including this past night. Um, and uh, I, I don't. Here's one thing: anybody that's saying that his cardio was bad because of that fight, uh, whatever. Do you, if you didn't see the, if you couldn't believe the pace that Paul was going at, you know, he nearly tried to put that fight away three or four separate times. And when you're trying to finish a fight, it's like sprinting really fast for like how many ever seconds you're doing that you're swinging you're using a lot of muscle which takes a lot of air out of you which yeah, uh you know a shitload of energy so oh yeah. definitely for the way i'm thinking looking at it is the fact that he was able to pour you know pour on that last volley in the third round was impressive man yeah we can't talk about there's, there's nothing to talk about as far as conditioning issues he has none Mm-hmm. Not that fight surely didn't show me any. He he was certainly tired by the end of that fight, but anybody would be. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, he still went for a really. He still had a really good chance of finishing at the beginning of the third round. Yeah, that was a great fight, and I. He lost no steam in those punches. Mm-mm. He lost no steam in those punches. That was just all heart and defense and resiliency from Santos to stay up and stay alive. And that's why I'm a fan of that dude now, because that was incredible. Great fight. That was a really great fight. That was one of Bellator's best fights uh, of the year thus far. Um, yeah. But so was the main event. And we, we, I, we're just going to go to the main event. Because let's be real. That King Mo Czech Congo fight was yeah. nothing special. That was just all smart. That was just wrestling superiority yep. by King Mo. And good for him. Uh, that, that mouth on him was definitely the high point of his whole appearance that night. <laughs> Which is good for him. You know, I'd rather see him play the heel at this point. You know, yeah. embrace it at this point. King Mo and uh, the state of Connecticut are not good friends right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I want the light heavyweight title shot. I want the heavyweight title shot. I want the catchweight title shot. <laughs> and Connecticut got some garbage. What is, is that? Did he really say that? I might have missed that. that. Oh, my God. That's crazy. Connecticut got some garbage. I totally missed that part. Wow. Yeah, dude. That's crazy. But hey, embrace it. I you might as well, you know. People are gonna want to watch you fight at this point, you know. So it, it works for him. Uh, so with that, we'll go to the main event. Uh, Emmanuel Newton defended his title against uh, Liam McGeary in a five-round fight that was an- another candidate for a fight of the year thus far because that was a great fight, especially for one of Bellator's best. Um, Liam McGeary went in there in the first round and got taken down. But holy shit, I mean, within the first two minutes, I believe, got a triangle. What I was so mad about was he had the triangle and, you know, he wasn't a, a – but, but because Emmanuel was defending in a sense that he was kind of posturing up, he had his head up enough to where he was getting some air. And what it didn't have a, it didn't have a it didn't have much to do with squeezing his legs as much as it had to do with uh, Liam needing to bring his head down, which he could have done if he did. But he 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 got fixated on attacking that arm, in which case he didn't know what to do with the arm after he was attacking it. And I just remember sitting there yelling at the TV, like Ah, Liam, get the bend it back, bend it, you know, or put some torque on the elbow, do something. He didn't know what to do, and then yeah. and, and oh I mean, man. That happened at least three times throughout this fight, and um, oh, I'd say four or five. Yeah, I mean, it real. he had five submission attempts in the first round. Yeah, uh, insane. Also, uh, no, he, if you watched it and saw, he absolutely broke the record of submission attempts in a fight in the Bellator promotion. Yeah, I believe it was um, seventeen or something. That's which yeah, is a crazy yeah, number in itself. Right. I mean, I'd like to know what the number is in a UFC yeah, fight. The record was, I want to say. 15. It was 15. No, 11 or 12. No, it was 11 or 12. It wasn't even that high, dude. Oh, I thought it was 15 held by somebody. Yeah, it was like 11 or 12, maybe 13. No, it was 15. I remember because in the last round they said he's tied for the record at 15 and then sure enough went for a few more in that fifth round. Uh, so I don't know who it was that was holding it. They, they might have said and I just forget. But, yeah, 17? Are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. Yeah. 
Um, McGeary is certainly a guy who 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 is active, works off off his back, which I admire. And you you know more fighters need to be that way, um, because you know look how look what it did for him. I say a, a lot of people were questioning that decision. It was a close fight. Let's be real. It could have gone either way, honestly. So I wasn't too upset with the decision at all. I did think Newton may have edged um, rounds two, four, and five, but at the same time, if you look at the second round, it, Liam was still attacking off his back. Um, in the fifth yeah. round, he was too. He was certainly not as effective off of his back as he was in the first um, or third. What a! But at, at the same time, if you look at the overall assessment of the fight, Liam did more damage. He put on more offense, and uh, I believe his striking was was you know a clear level ahead of of Emmanuel's because um, he he was landing Superman punches, counter strikes. He was dodging uh, a, a lot of Newton shots. So I believe in the stand up, he was better. Uh, especially, you know, with the grappling, it was it was kind of neck and neck, definitely because he Newton could get Liam down, but and he certainly did have to defend a lot of submissions, which props to, to Newton to have to uh, you know be careful for all of those, but Liam never let up and Liam kept trying and it made for such a great fight and uh, you know I kind of actually want to watch it again right now. <laughs> it was a great fight. Um, any last thoughts on that fight? Uh, I thought. I thought the score went the right way. Uh, I added uh, one and two for Newton, three, four, and five for McGeary. Um, one judge oh, really? Gave, yeah. One judge actually gave it uh, gave Newton an eight in one of the rounds. I want to say it was uh, round one. 46. Was, yeah, yeah. He, he got a 48-46 scorecard, which means, yeah, yeah he got, got an eight yeah, or something. He got an eight in one of them. And I want to say it was in the – I want to say that came from the first round. Yeah. the other – Second through fifth round, they were definitely more, much more competitive. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a lot more going on on both sides, but yeah, that first round, I could see it being a ten eight for McGeary. So uh, you know, uh, congrats to McGeary on becoming the first uh, British-born major champion in MMA. Definitely, that's a that's a thing we don't even recognize is that you know Britain's actually starting to catch up with these because let's look at that Paul Daly, uh, yeah. Lyndon Vassell, Vassell, you know, uh, we got a lot of and there are like a lot of unknowns on the preliminaries. Uh, I'll name a few, uh, you know, uh, where is he? Uh, Blair Tugman, that's one from uh, and he got a, 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 a dominant decision victory via wrestling. Um, and Dean Hancock, and those are some guys that you know. And he got his first round submission. And these guys, uh, these are Br- uh, British fighters that came out and you know delivered. Um, I-, I-, I like how, and, and you know, even Michael Page to a degree. Uh, I- it's questionable still because he's got to fight better competition, but we'll see that in, in, in due time. Thus far, he's very, he's definitely a very, uh, um, he's one of those guys you got to watch up and coming right now. And, uh, so I like it. Britain's really coming out and, and, and that's one of the things Bellator really does is, is nab these very, um, prominent British fighters right now. You haven't really seen too many go to, uh, the UFC in a while. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, kudos to Bellator. Now, while we're on that subject, let's actually talk about that. I don't, <laughs> it, you know, they announced the, the Kimbo Shamrock fight and, I I don't think I don't I'm like why well, you know, why is that necessary that hasn't been announced uh, on our podcast thus far so yeah Kimbo slice Ken Shamrock that's a thing of course I'm sure you know that by now so yeah going down I believe May May twentieth uh, June June, June. Uh, okay. yeah. that's crazy I don't I I think uh, I don't know why Kimbo even wants this fight you know first of all Ken hasn't fought in an MMA fight. Since 2010. And, I mean, I know Ken has competed in grappling and some bare-knuckle fights as of late, if anybody knows that. If you don't know, yes, Ken Shamrock has been competing in uh, bare-knuckle fights lately, (laughs) which is already a big no-no for a guy that shouldn't be fighting already anymore. Um, Yeah, he's 51 years old. (laughs) Is he? Yeah. God, yeah. he may be the oldest guy to ever compete in an MMA, like a, in a in a MMA sanctioned bout. Yeah. That's crazy, because yeah, you hear of like these sixty year old. I mean, because the 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 record is fifty one by uh by some guy that Gracie beat at UFC four, and I forget his name. Um, 
it was but it was this this guy who was like this karate master um it was uh it was this black dude you and he seemed like a cool dude his, his nickname was the dragon and i just can't remember his name for the life of me right now but he was 51 so in, in all of the ufc that's the record 51 <laughs> With I guess in 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 modern UFC the record being 47 by Randy Couture, um, right? So in a in a in a, in a major sanctioned bout, sanctioned I mean by a commission because that one with the old guy at UFC four wasn't a like a commission sanctioned fight. Right. I <laughs> he might yeah he'll certainly he probably will make the record for the oldest guy to ever get in there in a sanctioned MMA fight, which is crazy. Um, I I. It's, I Here's my problem with it. I don't think that in, it's it's necessary. I, I was cool with Kimball being there because he's still at a you know he's still at a com, uh, a combative age. He was he was undefeated in boxing, six knockouts, did did all right. I don't even think he should have left boxing honestly, but I, I figure you know if he comes to MMA, he's making a lot more money right now because he they were treating him like a guy coming up because they were really you know they were putting him on prelims or headlining these these uh, these small events you know. So it wasn't yeah. like he was getting too much money or too much attention. So I mean, you know, MMA you're probably gonna make more money. More more power to you then, you know. But Ken Shamrock, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. It, it, it sounds like Bellator is really just doing these gimmicky things. They don't need to though. The, that's that's proof of their last two cards, the Schmanko yeah. uh Manhoff fight. That yeah. that was a great card with just nothing but your guys that you've built up and and have come up and you had Pat Curran on the card and in this past card you had Paul Daly guys that you're bringing up Brandon Ward um, King Mo who's still a prominent fighter at his age still Liam McGeary making a statement for his country and for your promotion because that guy grew up in the UFC at this point essentially a lot of his best performances and moments in his MMA career are in Bellator that just shows you that they can make fighters that they can make their own stars it's just because they're so just ah with wanting to compete with the UFC they're not doing it like the UFC did where they were building names they were making their fighters prominently known just because of their skill and their their you know, you know they don't do that completely. Yeah. They they yeah. do for some, but not enough fighters are, are oh, being promoted well, that way. Like ever since, ever since Tito and Rampage, you know Bonner coming over there, those fights. I don't care about those fights. If I'm being absolutely fair and true to myself, I do not care about those fights. Mm -hmm. They do nothing for me. I want to see fights that eventually lead to or result in somebody becoming the champion. Yeah. I want to see no competition. I don't want to see these, you know, showcases of guys that used to be something, or you know, guys that are only getting these fights because of their, who they are, who they were. It's, I want to see people fighting because of who they are. You know. Yeah, my thing with this is this: I don't mind Tito, I don't mind Rampage, I don't mind Bonner. They can fight. Don't make them the main event. Don't make them the main attraction because you have other guys you can build up, fight for the belt. Put them in, you know, make those guys. Those are the guys coming up who they're going to have to pass the torch eventually. Yeah, exactly. Because Tito and Stefan and all those guys are going to be gone soon. Those guys are UFC fighters. I don't care who they sign with from now on. Those guys are UFC guys. Mm -hmm. And that's basically a concession saying that UFC guys make better fighters than we do. And that shouldn't be what – that's not their mission. Yeah, that shouldn't you know? be what they're promoting. You know? That shouldn't be what they're about. They shouldn't be like, yeah, we got guys that fought for the UFC. No. We got guys that can fuck with these guys in the UFC. That's we, got guys that you want, we, got, we got some guys that you want to watch too. UFC's not the only one putting guys out there that are going to be household names. We got some too. And that's what they need to focus on. Yeah, that's a big thing. And that's here's the thing with them is that now that they got Scott Cooker man, manning the helm, the helm, he's making some good decisions. He's treating the fighters better. A lot of the fighters have come out and said, man, my contract looks be great now. Uh, you know, even King Mo, who had a huge – beef with Bjorn Rebney um said no oh, it's night and day the way I get treated now it's it's way better you know we're all you know it, it is there is a def there's a definite difference in which Scott Coker runs things which is great if he can continue to really build on stars like Liam McGeary and yeah. you know because then there's going to be a day say he wins like 10 fights straight right now you never know what kind of star he could become he's got the potential though and he's going to be you're you're going to finally start to see if he can really start rallying fighters 
and 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 building them to the to the way like Liam has the potential to be. Like five years from now, you'll have a bunch of guys saying, "Oh, that's that Bellator fighter," or "Oh, Liam McGeary, that's that Bellator guy." You know, he there's that guy from Bellator. You know, guys were saying that about Eddie Alvarez, which you know, yeah, he went to the UFC. Good for him. That's good for him. I don't particularly think that everybody in Bellator needs to go to the UFC once they become a major star. They, yeah. they you know, because it seems like you know. Viacom and Bellator will be able to pay their fighters good. They'll be able to have successful, um, great careers so long as they don't just particularly build only a handful of guys. Because what did they have? They had my, they had only what um, Shlomenko, Alvarez, and Chandler, and and uh, the Currens. The Currens. I mean, I don't. I mean, I want Pat Curran to really get back up there. It's because he's not the champ now. It kind of falters from my mind. Um, yeah. But that's a guy too. Is that Pat is is one of these guys that's now starting to veteranize his career off of Bellator, which I which I like. Which you know, and I hope he gets back at that top level. And and you know, Daniel Strauss even that's a guy that's really making a name for himself. Um, his skill level has improved a lot, and he's he's really looked great at lightweight, even winning his last fight a few weeks back. And um, you know, of course, you got guys like Will Brooks, who I feel like they're not doing a good job with. Um, I think they could do better with promoting him. He's their champ. He needs to be. Uh, um, you know, recognize a little better. Um, yeah. You know, see, but that's the thing is that they can real, they have the potential to build their stars, and if they follow the same the same pattern, not even the same, but at least a, a similar one to the UFC from back in the days, they really need to kind of go old school with how they promote their fighters, not throw these these old guys or f- guys from the UFC in, in our faces while these other guys are taking are taking back seat to these guys. They shouldn't have to. For example, uh, you know, Ill Will fought on a card under Stefan Bonner and Tito Ortiz. Ortiz, yeah. That's, it was a title fight. Yeah, Chandler in there too, which is crazy. Big no-no in my opinion. That's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And you had, you know, Joe Schilling and uh, and uh, Nova Manhoff on the same card. Yeah, you know, gotta be kidding me. There's another guy who you could really, you know, who's now doing both MMA and, and Joe Schilling has a fight next month, by the way. So I'm excited for that. Um, in Bellator, which is great, you know, and he's 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 managing both kickboxing and Bellator, which is great. And there's another guy, you know, you could really put out there and build a career for um, going forward. And I like it. And that's what they need to do. They need to not. They need to put these guys in the front seat. For everybody to see and put these these stars in in the in the in the back because we'll we'll still see them we'll see them we'll be like whoa that's crazy okay I kind of want to see that fight too and it goes behind a great title fight like say Liam versus even um, Vassal you know or or somebody or even King Mo that could happen you never know I don't believe that'll be the next fight but it could happen someday and then that's the kind of main event with uh, you you back somebody behind that main event that's a great main event already but then you put like Kimbo versus any Anybody else? That's a strong card already because now you have an attraction right there in the co-main, but then you have the star attraction, which is the future of the of the uh, sport, which is Liam McGeary versus King Mo, and that that'd be crazy good. Yeah, yeah. My thing is they need to put their title. They need to showcase their title. Yeah, Don't they're belt holders. Yeah. I mean, does anybody yeah. even know that Will Brooks is the lightweight champion of that promotion? That's I don't think a lot of people do. Know. Why would they know? Because they they watch that one to see Tito and Stephen. Fight. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah, it's that's pretty bad. I mean, because especially if you put a name, it's that's the thing though, is that sometimes p- people tune in just to see the main events. If they tune in to see those kind of crazy attractions and they see that it's in the co-main and then they see a crazy title fight's about to go down, they'll stay and watch that crazy title fight and then they'll go, "Whoa, that was crazy! That's that champion." Who's this guy? And now they know it's burning their heads. And then the next time they hear them fighting, hey guys, come over to the house. This guy's fighting. You gotta see him fight. That's how you do business right there. That's how, that's how you gotta get it done. Mm. Straight on. So I mean, we we gotta talk to the Bellator PR team because this is ridiculous. Yeah, that's- I just hope they get the point soon because that's how it needs to be done. I know that we're here talking about it right now, and that's how that's at least to us. I mean, but we're just us. But <laughs> at the same time, I believe that we're making some sense. Because – and I would hope that they at least to some degree know that that's what they need to do. Um, yeah, I, I, I believe that these last two cards were perfect examples of, of us making sense right now. Yeah. I don't think there are too many people in the world that could rightly disagree with us right now. Mm-hmm. Not to sound like we're just know-it-alls, but I think our points are solid. 
I think anybody that watches the sport would make the same point. Yeah. Anybody that really watches and under, has any kind of understanding of how it works, they would they would agree or they would make the same point even without hearing us. Yeah, so, Bellator has developed these fighters to the point where I want to see them succeed. You know? Yeah. I mean, people. I mean, there was a point last year before Scott came around. Um, about a year and a half ago where people were just making fun of Bellator. It was like, oh, you guys are idiots. You don't know what you're doing. And, that, and you know, they didn't have much argument back for that. They weren't treating their fighters good. They were they were putting these these former UFC guys ahead of everybody. Not that, not to say, oh, cool for Rampage, because he's, he's still in the game, still doing his thing. And while he's never going to win a belt in the UFC, fighting for Bellator was smart and having him out was smart. But, you know, use him to help sell the rest of your product, which is the rest of your fighters, the rest of your roster, guys that you're paying to go out there and make a name for themselves. And, um, you know, if, 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 Bellator, if people know that Bellator is on board with showing you these guys – um, and making you, making sure you understand this is our team, this is our roster, these are who we have, these are fighters that we are building. Um, then it makes sense to have those guys. But yeah. you know, busting them in my face all day with oh, Bottom versus Tito, uh, and then and then showing just their faces and their fights and their highlights, and then just showing the name Brooks versus Chandler at the bottom. What the hell? <laughs> That's the title <laughs> fight. You know what I mean? Let's not. That's basically- they're screwing their own brand over yeah. by doing that. Uh, and and so I, I, I hope that they see with these cards coming up, especially with the last two that have been great. Again, congrats to Liam McGeary because I'm a fan now. Um, Absolutely. Also props to John Liot, our, uh, uh, one of our MMAD admins who doesn't ever do anything. But he's <laughs> all, <laughs> he's been busy uh, doing photography and, and working uh, working for Liam. And uh, so congrats to, to him as well. For uh, I'm sure what was a fun night for him seeing his boy get a belt, which is uh, awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm a huge awesome. fan of McGeary, so it, it, that's the thing is that I want to see Bellator uh, succeed, and I, I want to see their fighters come up, and and I like it. And, and you never know, five, ten years from now, they have all the time in the world to to really build themselves. It's not a race, it really isn't. MMA is gonna be around for a while. We're all gonna be fans. Give us some time. Take your time. You're gonna be number two for a while. You can't beat that you can't fight that if you want to be number one you got to really catch up and they're nowhere near that they need to catch up and there's no problem with taking it slow and steady and so i hope with that they they start you know taking that to heart and yeah they yeah bellator world series of fighting is the same way but i feel like they get the gist yeah yeah they're they're a ways back but they're definitely doing it the way they should do it Mm -hmm. you know they're doing it the way they're supposed to do it so Bellator just needs to try and be a little more organic and not so much trying to acquire stuff from other promotions and using whatever they've acquired just fresh off of, you know, the waiver list, if you will, for lack of a better term for the, you know, certain purposes. Instead of just picking up, you know, scraps or picking up, you know, guys that have names and aren't busy right now, they got nothing else to do, you know, build it from the ground, take it from, you know, who made you what you are. Take from the guys that are going to be the future of your promotion. Yeah, exactly. And so with that, I actually think light heavyweight has gotten much more interesting uh, oh, yeah. in Bellator uh, as opposed to like a year ago. Um, Most definitely. So that's definitely awesome. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the guys they've acquired, but there is, you yeah. know, that it, it use it to sell what you, what's brand new, what's fresh, what's going to be your main money maker five years from now. You know what I mean? Cause it'll take some time, but they'll get there as long as they as long as they know to sell these these guys that they have right now. And I'm again especially looking forward to seeing Liam. I'm especially looking forward to seeing Paul Daly. I'm exp- yeah. I, I, I I want him to stay at Bellator. I want him to stay there, fight off some contenders, get to that belt, become Bellator champ. That'd be cool. Um, oh yeah. Him or anybody, just anybody that could get in there and, and, and you know make a name for themselves in this promotion. I I think it'd be cool if everybody just kind of stuck where they're at, and then all these guys from lesser promotions go to either the World Series of Fighting, either Bellator or either the UFC, not to Bellator for like two fights and then go to the UFC. You know that's always un- annoying and bugging me yeah. and stuff. Um, especially if they're prominent names, then use your name, stay where you're at. You might make more money somewhere else than you would in the UFC. They probably pay you less the second you enter in. You know what I mean? I'm sure that's the case for some guys, unless they really just want to fight in the UFC, which, uh, you know, for anybody trying to chase that dream, go ahead and get that done. Um, but 
you know, that's the thing is that I just, you know, people need to know what they're signing up for, what they're getting into, because I, I think that's what each promotion, the top three, those are the top three, um, need to, need to, need to really explain to fighters once they sign them in. If they see something about them that they want to keep long term, got to explain that, make that, make that uh, a part of your negotiation. And so that way nobody gets screwed like Eddie, you know. Yeah. Um, that's the thing, and that that was one of the very big critical points in which uh, in Bjorn Rebney's uh, reign, I guess you could say, as the at Bellator president. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, with that, you got anything else you want to bring up? Uh, Tamron McCoy is back. Yay! <laughs> yeah, he had a, a decent performance. Um, I was actually uh, I thought he was gonna lose to be honest with you, but. <laughs> Uh, but that was a great uh, performance. He got that done out, out of there quick. Thunder Horse himself is back. The barn cat. <laughs> yeah, but that was a, that was a great performance. I forget who he fought, but it was a quick yeah, fight. Yeah. Uh, submission, I believe, it was an armbar. Yeah, um, looking a lot less nerdy these days. <laughs> Good but, friend. Uh, yeah, I like I said, this is, it's a great time in MMA. I know a lot of bullshit's been starting off this this the, this uh, this year, but it seems to have started to really pick up. Uh, some momentum this month. I, I believe February was really good to MMA. Um, you know, uh, with the pre what with the press conferences, uh, with the um, with with uh, especially all the shit that started up in January. Regardless of the great fights that happened in January, there was a lot of negative stuff going on with Anderson Silva's test and PEDs and all this stuff. Uh, we've gotten a lot of good things out of it. Great fights, especially from Bellator, especially from the UFC. Um, a lot of uh, tis the season for upsets as well. We've seen a lot of those, um, a lot of advancements in, from the UFC in trying to better their testing, which is great uh, for future for the future, you know. And uh, you know, I, I'm like it. I, I, I'm I'm I, I think the second month of the year really kind of helped pick everything up. And wow, it's already March. Can you believe that? Yep. It's kind of crazy. It's what, already March. What was your favorite uh, fight of of the month of February? I actually think that'd be a cool thing to do. Yeah, I mean, you gotta think about that one. Huh? Benson Henderson. Benson Henderson's fight. Benson Henderson. I'm gonna have to go. With, yeah, this first one I can think of, so it must be my favorite one. But that was an awesome fight. Everybody, and I mean everybody, had Benson Henderson out of that fight just from the from the weigh ins, from how Brandon Thatcher was able was able to finish all of the fights that he won. Uh, Benson coming into 170 for the first time. Everybody had Benson Henderson dead to rights, myself included. I'm not afraid to admit that. But boy, did Benson Henderson ever prove that he really is a champion. And he just pulled off the win like he was supposed to do. What so, about yeah, um, I love that fight? A yeah, lot. that would probably be arguably my submission of the month. Um, okay. Just uh, trying to think about it. Hmm. And then there was what other events there were. There was also oh, you know what my favorite knockout of the month was? Let's see, knockout, knockout. I'll knockout. tell you mine. Shlomenko's spinning back fist uh, KO yeah, over yeah, Melvin Manhoff. Oh man, that was brutal. That was off the chain. Was, oh man, that was that pretty was boat. Cool, yeah, that was pr oh, that was brilliant. Uh, another one that comes to mind is Sam Alves, but just the the way that you know a spinning back fist, come on, that was pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that uh, remember that Superman punch knockout from uh? Oh yeah. Oh, what's his name? It was a Canadian kid, and he just hits a nice. Chas shoot. Skelly. Yeah. Was it Chas Skelly? Uh, uh, was it? I don't know. It was what was the weight class? I want to say it was one seventy. Uh, oh, I'm thinking of the, what card was it on? Was it on the Bigfoot card? Yeah, it was, huh? Oh, okay, let me think. Let me think. Let me think. Cody Gibson? No, no, it's a bantamweight. Oh, uh, was it Sean Strickland? Man, who got uh, that one? Wait, he fought. He knocked out a black guy, a black Brazilian guy. Oh uh, no, Ponzinibbio won that fight. I'm thinking. Okay. Ponzinibbio won. Yeah, so that wasn't it. It was uh. Let's see if I can look it up. Matt Dwyer. Matt Dwyer? Probably. Let me see. Let me look him up. Matt Dwyer. Is he Canadian? Sounds Canadian. 
Let's look. Let's look. Let's look. Is a Canadian mixed martial artist fighting for the welterweight division? Uh, Superman punch. Yep. Yeah. Matt Dwyer knocked out William Macario with a Superman punch. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good one. I'm gonna keep with mine. Shemenko with the spinning back fist, but that would probably yeah, be number two. Yeah, that was definitely the most brutal. Yeah, but yeah, Matt Dwyer's would probably Matt be number two. Manoff hasn't had a good run lately. He's just getting destroyed. Ugh. Yeah. Um, as far as submission of the month, I would say, hmm, it is between Henderson and I don't know why I'm thinking of anything else. It's probably just gonna be Henderson. I, you know, um, Jake Ellenberg is a good candidate though. Yeah, Ellenberger's nice. Even Ronda for pulling it off as fast as she did. You gotta get something for That's that. That's true, man. Ronda's just dope all the way. She just wins Women's MMA Fighter of the Month. Let's just go with that. <laughs> yeah. Of any yeah. promotion, anywhere. Because you would want to say Cyborg with that quick knockout of hers, but, you know. There's this one chick you gotta check out on Invicta. For anybody that hasn't, Alexa Grasso, who fought on the co main event of Invicta. My god. She looks like a female Floyd. I'm not even kidding with you when I say that. Her head movement and footwork and hand speed and boxing overall. I mean, she trains in Mexico with some of the best, like, actual boxing trainers. Um, and just, you know, and, and works her jiu-jitsu. So she's strictly a boxer who likes to mix in kicks. But her boxing, holy shit. If you look this fight up for anybody that wants to, to, to see some superb female MMA skills. And and for anybody that thinks that female MMA chicks don't have skill, check this chick out. Alexa Grasso in her last fight um, at Invicta FC 11, which happened last Friday. Oh, my goodness. She is amazing. And I just fell in love with her. I'm a huge fan already. I hadn't – I'd only seen one fight from her uh, before, and she finished uh, off with a submission real quick. But she looks amazing. She's 7-0 and now. Check her out uh, if you haven't already, Jonas, because yeah, I'm right. telling you, you will be surprised. Um, Alexa Grasso? Alexa Grasso, yeah. G-R-A-S-S-O. Um, I'm definitely going to hit her up. I want her on the podcast. <laughs> it's somebody <laughs> Um, shout out to Jordan Parsons. Uh, he recently uh, announced, uh, who was on our podcast. If you didn't listen to that one, uh, Jordan Parsons was on our podcast, uh, Bellator MMA featherweight now, um, fi- uh, getting a, a fight in May. It's going to be announced next week. So hopefully we'll be getting it. Um, we're getting the announcement for that next week by the next time we uh, put this out next week for anybody that's listening. Uh, I think we're good there. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome yeah. podcast, Jonas. You're awesome to talk to. You know that, right? You know, yeah, like, man. It's, it's always fun, dude. Definitely. I like being able to do this, so, you know. We we'll need be to get you here. on here more, bro. Yeah, man. We'll definitely do this some more. Love having you on. Fans, thank you for uh, hitting us up. For anybody that wants to see where we're at, anybody listening on Stitcher or iTunes, please uh, give us a like and a share uh, on Facebook, MMA Discussion. No S at the end. Um, if you want to find us on uh, – or find our um, – our, our website that sponsors us, Sports of Anarchy, uh, at Sports of Anarchy, our Twitter handle. If you want to get a hold of me on Twitter, I've been getting a few of you lately, and I appreciate it. Um, at Nick the Phantom, uh, my Twitter handle. Um, Jonas doesn't do that, so you can just get a hold of me. I'll talk to Jonas for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, or you can just message the page on Facebook. I'm sure he'll get a hold of you there. Yeah. <clears throat> well, appreciate you having me, Jonas. You're uh, my, uh, obviously you're my favorite guy to always have on here, especially oh, wow. Zach. Yeah, yeah. Zach would be if he would get on here, but he doesn't. So you're the, you're the favorite always now. <laughs> By default. By I'll default. For now, I mean, uh, who even knows? Because Zach kind of Zach would only be entertaining in the sense that me and him argue, and when we argue, it always gets fun. Because uh, yeah. yeah. I can have a I can have a hardcore discussion with him and it doesn't turn into some immature bullshit, you know? Yeah, exactly. I was actually a good guy as far as uh, discussing MMA goes. Yeah, sure. definitely. Want to get you on here again? You're uh, again. You're my favorite dude. Fight fans, please give us a share, a like, subscribe on uh, iTunes. Uh, again, free to download on any smartphone. You don't need an iPhone for it. Um, if you have a blue or a Blackberry or whatever you guys got these days, do all those <laughs> galaxy phones, whatever the fuck. Um, I just have an iPhone. I don't know what any other phones exist to be honest with you. Um, but any smartphone you have free to download stitcher, uh, 
plenty of other great podcasts, a lot of great bands, a lot of great uh, music and, and other podcasts, science-y stuff, comic book stuff, whatever you're into. Stitcher probably has it. Um, again, MMA discussion. We appreciate you, Fight Fans. Thanks for listening. Signing off. Say, say goodbye, Jonas. Goodbye, folks. <laughs>